The world that we live in is filled with chaos. We are all searching for meaning in our lives, but we often get lost along the way. We all must ultimately realize that meaning is found in responsibility for our actions, for the way we live our life, and for the people in our lives. We don't have to stay in the chaos. We can choose to bring order to our lives. Join us for a fresh perspective on the practical steps we can take to become who God intended us to be and to realize what our calling is. This is Coming Out of Chaos. Welcome back to the Coming Out of Chaos podcast, coming to you from the upper room at St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Springdale, Arkansas. This is Michael Bocklig. I am your host, and I am back with my co-host, Bryce Kirk. Bryce, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Michael. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, this is now our second episode in this brand new podcast, and our first episode was more of an introduction. It was a little bit of an overview and kind of setting some ground rules, talking about what we're going to talk about. Now we're going to jump into some material, and my hope is that, God willing, this may be helpful to a lot of the men that are out there and that are searching for direction. And Bryce, in the first episode, we talked a lot about the Orthodox Church, and for good reason. You and I are both Orthodox Christians, and so it's important that everyone knows that that's where we're coming from. That's where a lot of our experiences have been for me for my whole life, for you in recent years. And those are the experiences we're going to really focus on, because I think we both agree that the Orthodox Church has a lot of things within it that are helpful to help a man to put his life into order and to have a direction and a goal. Would you agree with that, Bryce? Oh, absolutely, 100%. There's actually an article that is called Why Orthodox Men Love Church, and it's by Frederica Matthews Green. And this article, it's actually on our church website because we thought it would be good to have on the website. There's a lot of men, especially young men, coming to our church here locally. And we've noticed that that seems to be the case across the entire diocese, the Diocese of Miami in the Southeast, where we are. And we're actually going to put this article on our Antiochian Men website as well. So if anyone out there is interested in reading the article and following along with us, You can find that at antiochianmen.org, and just click on the Documents page, and the article will be at the top of the page there. So you can check that out if you would like to. And so this article is is a fascinating perspective on some of the reasons why Orthodox Christianity resonates with men. And so what we thought we would do is go through this and give our perspective, uh, kind of piece by piece on what this article is saying. And so we're just going to go ahead and read a little bit at a time, and then Bryce and I will give our comments and talk about our experience and and hopefully maybe expand upon some of the concepts that are brought up in this article. So I'm just going to dive right into this. In a time when churches of every description are faced with vanishing male syndrome, men are showing up at Eastern Orthodox churches in numbers that, if not numerically impressive, are proportionally intriguing. This may be the only church which attracts and holds men in numbers equal to women. And I'm going to stop right there. And Bryce, I feel like this this is really speaking to what we're experiencing. And we kind of brought this up in our first episode, the fact that we're seeing uh, men coming to our church here, and that that's, it's, it's not just a one-off. It's happening really all over the place from what we've been hearing. And so... I wanted to ask you about this term, vanishing male syndrome, which is interesting. And since you haven't been in the Orthodox Church your whole life, Bryce, I think you might have an interesting perspective having been a part of other churches. And so what are your thoughts about this vanishing male syndrome? Do you think that 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 is a thing? Well, Michael, I do think to an extent, I, I believe that to be true. I grew up, as I mentioned in the first episode, in a Lutheran church. And we had a good amount of men. There wasn't a ton of young men and a ton of young couples involved in our church. And as I went to college and I got involved with student ministries, we would always make jokes about how it was a good ratio for the young men because Mm. it would be exponentially more women Mm. involved than there were men. 
And we never quite understood why that may be. And then some of the churches I went to before coming to St. Nicholas and becoming Orthodox, there wasn't a huge male presence in any church. And I found that to be interesting. And when I came into St. Nicholas, I noticed men of all ages, young kids up to men my age, men a little bit older than I, and then older men as well. And like you said, Michael, the last couple of years, we've really seen an influx of people, especially young men coming to the church. Yeah, The Amen spiritual advisor, Father Hans Jacobsi, has said that uh, he's seen a trickle of men coming into the church that will eventually turn into a full-on stream. Yeah. Yeah, and that stream honestly could become a river. The way things are going especially, and from what we've noticed, that that vanishing male syndrome term in this first sentence of the article is, is fascinating to me. As you know, I've only been in the Orthodox Church. Uh, I've noticed, though, over the years that there seems to be a void in the Church Uh, not necessarily of men, but of just young adults in the Orthodox Church I'm speaking of. And in our church, thank God, that's not the case. We're actually seeing the opposite. We have a very healthy chunk of young adults in our parish here at St. Nicholas Church in Springdale. But what I, I think that I'm starting to notice is that there are a lot of young adults, both men and women, coming to the church. But it seems to be the case that there's more men showing up than women, at least in the last couple of years. I've noticed that when the men show up, sometimes the women aren't too far behind them. And, and that's something that I think we'll be able to start talking about it as this article goes on. The next sentence says, as Leon Pottles wrote in his 1999 book, The Church Impotent, The Feminization of Christianity, the Orthodox are the only Christians who write basso profundo church music or need to. And basso profundo, for those who are listening, and, and put to put that in layman terms, in case you don't know what that means, it's basically your deep male bass singers. So the Orthodox Church has lots of chanting, lots of hymns, and we have, in, in some Orthodox traditions, there is a very healthy representation of men that have those deep singing voices. And so it's an interesting reference in this book, The Church Impotent, The Feminization of of Christianity. That book is an interesting one, and the title itself is interesting as well, because it's it's claiming that Christianity has been feminized. And I think it's speaking to Western Christianity, and a lot of what you see in, in some of our Protestant friends' churches, uh, also maybe in the, in the Roman Catholic Church as well, this feminization of not just Christianity, but of Christ. And, and I'm really interested, Bryce, in your perspective on this. Do you believe that, that that's the case, that in, in some churches in the West, that there's a feminization of Christianity happening? Frankly, I do think that's true to a degree. And full disclosure, I have not read this book. Michael, I don't believe you've read this I book. I have not either, either, no. But um, I remember reading a book when I was younger called Wild at Heart. And one of the first things in that book mentions, there's an expectation of men in many Western churches at least in the Protestant tradition, who the men are expected to be nice guys. Mm -hmm. They're not expected to cause a riff. They're not expected to really do anything else other than to kind of chat it up at the church coffee hour. Yeah, and the other thing that I would say, even in the Orthodox Church, again, having only experienced Orthodoxy, we still are not immune to the conditioning that happens in our society, in the culture that we live in. And as I was growing up and going through the public school system, as I had friends that were Protestant, as I watched, honestly, a lot of media, a lot of entertainment, movies, there is a conditioning that happens where Christ becomes a very different figure than what the Orthodox Church teaches. And so one of the things in my earlier days that I really, unfortunately, stumbled with is the proper understanding of Christ and what his authentic masculine virtues were, and how he exhibited them so perfectly. And so in order to understand authentic masculinity, we have to understand who is the authentic Jesus Christ. And one of the things I wanted to bring up is the image of Christ on the cross. It's a really fascinating thing that in a lot of Western churches, Christ is portrayed more as a victim on the cross and not as a victor 
as he is portrayed in the Orthodox Church. And the being a victor is really more of a spiritual reality that is happening, right? Because when we look at the icon, for example, in the Orthodox Church of Christ on the cross, he is being executed. There's no escaping that fact. However, he's not helpless. He is voluntarily going to his execution. And so we say he ascends the cross voluntarily in the Orthodox Church. And that's a big difference. And uh, Bryce, I, I know you've seen the interview that, that I did recently for the Antiochian Men with Jonathan Pajot. And he's an Orthodox iconographer. He's very well known, has a YouTube channel with lots of followers. And in an interview I did with him, he talked about how the early church really struggled with how to show Christ on the cross in icons because of this fact where it was so difficult to show someone being executed as a victor. So there was a long period of time that passed before the church even tried to create an icon of Christ on the cross. And when they did, Jonathan Pajot explained that they actually wrote the icon as Christ kind of standing in front of the cross and also in a royal robe to show the spiritual reality of his victory. And I thought that was very interesting. And Bryce, I was wondering if you might have any perspective on, on that, that stark contrast between how the Orthodox Christian church sees Christ and, and how other Western Christians do. Right. And Michael, I think that really does go down to iconography. Mm -hmm. We have a visual representation of Christ in our churches and of the saints. I remember my first Sunday at St. Nicholas, I walked in the door, front door, looked to the left, and there's a big icon of Christ at his resurrection. And I'm looking at it now. He has destroyed the gates of Hades. Yeah. And he is raising up the dead. And he is standing triumphantly with people at his side. And there's just something about that. I mean, he literally destroyed death by dying. Yeah. And in the chant in which we do in the Paschal period, and for those of you who are not familiar with the term Pascha, that is what the Eastern Orthodox churches refer to as Easter. In the period in between Pascha and Pentecost, we chant, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. That's and right. upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. And that imagery in your mind, and not that the Western Christians don't understand the triumph of that, but visually looking at that in iconography and visually hearing that in your mind, the chant itself is just so, it's a, it's a victory. Yeah, it's rousing. Exactly. Yeah, it really inspires you from the inside. And that's one thing about iconography is that it really helps us to see spiritual realities in something material. It's, it's one of those things that are often misunderstood. You know, a lot of people see icons and think they're idols. They, uh, they think that we might be worshiping idols. We're not. And there is a difference between worshiping and veneration. And we may come back to that, but I want to get back to this article uh, to, to kind of go through that first. But that's something that we can definitely come back to. Here's the next paragraph of the article. Rather than guess why this is, and this is the author speaking, I emailed a hundred Orthodox men, most of whom joined the church as adults. What do they think makes this church particularly attractive to men? Their responses below may spark some ideas for leaders in other churches who are looking for ways to keep guys in the church. So the first section is subtitled Challenges. The term most commonly cited by these men was challenging. Orthodoxy is active and not passive. And it's the only church where you are required to adapt to it rather than it adapting to you. And Bryce, we just talked about that in our first episode. The longer you are in it, the more you realize it demands of you. And those are all direct quotes from people who responded to those emails that the author sent out. So this term challenging that it was most brought up by men, I find that fascinating because if you look at the liturgical year and all of the many services that occur in the Orthodox Church, just making it to all of those services is very challenging. You know, finding the time to go to the services during Great Lent, for example, there's almost a service every day of the week. And in Holy Week, there's multiple services a day. Mm -hmm. So talk about a challenge, Bryce. 
I think men do like a challenge, but this is the kind of challenge that you don't find in the world. It's a very, it's a very deep challenge that challenges you spiritually and not just physically. Although I think there is a physical element to it. What are your thoughts on that, Bryce? Well, it made me think, again, of things I observed in my first Divine Liturgy. Orthodoxy demands much of your senses. Mm-hmm. All five of your senses are in tune, as it were, when you're in the liturgy. Physically, you're making prostrations, you're crossing yourself, you're doing matanyas, which is leaning down in front of you and crossing yourself. You smell the incense, you participate in the, in the music. Mm-hmm. And it's not, not that you need to feel good about it. It is that you are caught up in the in the liturgy, in the chanting. You're fully engaged. Absolutely. And tonight we were chanting at Vespers and, you know, all of the verses that we chant are about an event in Christ's life or an event in his Holy Mother's life or in the saints' lives. And there are concepts of heroism and courage and valor and love and all of these things. When you pay attention to it, it's almost impossible not to see it. Yeah, that's very true, Bryce. And I was also thinking about, you know, I have been to other churches, other Protestant churches, and I've noticed that there seems to be a big difference with how the people attend the services. It, it's more of an audience mindset in a Protestant church, from my observation, versus the Orthodox Church, where, just like this article says, it's active. It's not passive. We're not sitting down and listening to a sermon for most of the service. There's a very specific type of worship that happens in a liturgical structure. There's a lot of structure to it, and there's a lot of participation. We're active, not passive, like this article is saying. And so I think that's one of the big differences, and it honestly might be one of the things that people struggle with when they first come to the Orthodox Church because it's so drastically different from what they're used to. They're used to coming in and sitting down, maybe pulling out their hymnal and and flipping to the page of whatever hymn is being sung that day on a Sunday. But in the Orthodox Church, everything has a reason for being. Everything in the service means something, and there's so much depth to it. You could really spend your whole life studying just the liturgical services and not get to the bottom of it. Bryce, you said in our first episode that when you first came to this church at St. Nicholas, it was a huge shock to you. It was very different than what you were used to. What was it about it that made you want to stay? I think, Michael, when I first came into the church, you know, it was a shock. Everything was so much different. And in my former tradition, We did have some of the elements such as, you know, liturgical colors Mm -hmm. and specific songs. I mean, Lutherans have a liturgy. It's modeled after the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which most Eastern Orthodox churches in this country and across the world use throughout the year. And with that being said, it seemed like every single element of the liturgy was important and everybody was involved. The attentiveness to detail was something that I noticed almost right away. Yeah. Yeah, and that actually is very challenging to jump into that environment. And it's like jumping into the fast lane on the highway. You have to make sure that you have got enough speed going so that you don't get run over. And and that really is the experience because we're we're entering into something we're expected to participate. It's not a passive experience. You know, this article says it's the only church where you're required to adapt to it rather than it adapting to you. And we talked a lot about that in the first episode, where we come to the church expecting to be transformed. We also come to the church expecting to participate, and that we're not just an audience. We're not sitting down and waiting for something to happen. You know, it it is something that takes effort. And then this last part, the longer you are in it, the more you realize it demands of you. I wouldn't say that we come to the church and we feel like we're, we're being forced into doing something. Ideally, we want to do what is being demanded of us. And that speaks to having discipline. And having discipline is very important for people, especially if their lives are chaos. The disciplines of the church are there for our spiritual growth and development. 
And we don't take that individually. We actually need to come into the church, and we have to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we have to be guided by someone. Ultimately, having a spiritual father. We mentioned that in the first episode. So the structure is there. And for those who are really struggling to have order in their lives, what a great place to start, to actually do that within the body of Christ. You know, in the first episode too, Bryce, we talked about the church. We said the term the church over and over again, but the church is the body of Christ. And to really have an understanding of what that means, you have to be in the church, wouldn't you say? Yeah, Michael, 100%. You need to be an active participant. There is no single Christian. We are all together. It is, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you have an understanding that you perhaps are in chaos or you know somebody who is in chaos. Exactly. I came to the church to find the truth. And the truth is not just a concept or a philosophical principle. It is a man, and that's Jesus Christ. Exactly. Yes. And so I'm going to go to the next paragraph of this article. The, quote, sheer physicality of Orthodox worship, unquote, is part of the appeal. Regular days of fasting from meat and dairy, standing for hours on end, performing prostrations, which is something you mentioned, Bryce, going without food and water before communion, for example. When you get to the end, you feel that you face down a challenge. Orthodoxy appeals to man's desire for self-mastery through discipline. I already mentioned discipline earlier, but this self-mastery is so important. If we are ever going to have a chance to come out of the chaos, we have to master ourselves. And I know this is something that Father Hans has been telling us now for years, and it's really resonated with myself and I know with you, Bryce, as well. Self-mastery is key, and we can really do that in the ascetical disciplines within the church. Some of those disciplines include fasting, which was mentioned. You know, a prostration we should probably define. You know, you used the word matanya earlier. That's when you make a bow, usually all the way to the ground, make a sign of the cross. Usually prostrations are something we do during Great Lent and during Holy Week. And that is when you actually go all the way down to the ground with your whole body and put your head essentially to the floor and then get back up again. That's something that for some of us that are familiar with the monastic way of life, they do those on a very regular basis in a monastic setting. But during Great Lent, during Holy Week, we can get a little taste of what the monks do. And all of these ascetical disciplines that happen, even during the services, they're not just a big challenge. I would say that they're tools. They're tools for us to help us to strive for self-mastery. And so I would like to ask you, Bryce, as a younger man, you have a lot of, I'm sure, distractions and temptations that you're dealing with. How important is it to you to have self-mastery? Michael, I'm glad that you brought that up because I do think that in the sense of truly knowing who you are, being able to master yourself, being able to submit the passions in which you pursue, which the passions, for those who may not be aware, is, I guess, the term the flesh that many in the West Passions use. of the flesh, yeah. Passions of the flesh. And many of these things are very difficult to overcome, and some of them may take an entire lifetime to get over. Yeah. And I'm also glad, Michael, that you brought up Great Lent and Holy Week. So for Great Lent, in the Orthodox tradition, we will fast for 40 days until Palm Sunday, and then we fast again That's right. until Great and Holy Pascha. And you had mentioned to me this year, Michael, we had both tried to make it to every service that we could. Mm-hmm. I think we both maybe missed one or two. But at the end of the week, you had felt true exhaustion. Yes, I really did. <laughs> and that exhaustion is rewarding, and not in the self-fulfilling way yeah. of you know, reward, shall we say, but for your salvation. Yes. All of these things are there for your salvation. The church gives you the tools. They give you an entire toolbox for you to access. Yeah. And you work through that. Yeah, and this past Lent, I think, is a great example, Bryce, because you're right. I was I was kind of hoping to make all the services, and and even before Lent started, I just wanted to check the box that I had been to all of them or as many of them as I could. 
but I was really missing the point. And this past Lent, I really learned something important. And it wasn't so much to make sure that I was attending all the services. It was to push me past the point of being exhausted. And I didn't realize this until the end of Holy Week this past year. That is such a necessary experience because it really forces you to realize that you need God. You have to rely on God, and it's not all about you. And when we are at that point of exhaustion, it's so much easier to see that. And so these ascetical disciplines and these services, there's, there's a reason for all of it. If we didn't have such a demanding schedule to keep up with, we might fall into the trap of thinking that we ourselves alone, without anyone's help, without God's help, can overcome anything. And that's simply just not the case. So I think this really goes beyond being just a challenge. It becomes more a way for us to fully become who we were intended to be. And to do that, we have to break down our pride and to, again, get past that point of exhaustion so that we can rely on God. Okay, Bryce, let's continue on with the article. This next section says, in Orthodoxy, the theme of spiritual warfare is ubiquitous. Saints, including female saints, are warriors. Warfare requires courage, fortitude, and heroism. We are called to be strugglers against sin, to be athletes, as St. Paul says, and the prize is given to the victor. The fact that you must struggle during worship by standing up throughout long services is itself a challenge men are willing to take up. And Bryce, we talked about spiritual warfare in our first episode, and we also mentioned the saints. I believe you mentioned them. What's been your experience like getting to know the saints? I remember the year after I became Orthodox, I was back home in Salt Lake City, and I was attending church at St. Peter and Paul Antiochian Church in Salt Lake City downtown, and Father Justin Havens was giving a homily. And in his parish, they have icons of the saints mm -hmm. all over their walls. Sure. So saints like St. Patrick, St. Thecla, St. Mary of Egypt, all of these people who we hope to cover more in future episodes and perhaps through your own research. But he said, a monk told him once, he said, your people should be inspired to be like the people on your walls. Mm. And the reason he said that is not because they themselves are gods of any type in the sense of they are an object to be worshipped. They are an example of love for Christ that goes across the spectrum. Some people were martyred for their faith, yeah. confessing Christ with their blood. Others lived very sinful lives and came around and dedicated everything to the love of God. And so that aspect to me, we have all of these people who came before us, just like we have our own family members who came before us that we may aspire to be like or attributes that they may have had that we ourselves see in ourselves. And when we take on a patron in the church, some say the patron is the one that chooses you. Yeah. And the idea of that, like Michael, your patron saint is St. Michael the Archangel. That's right. And he's often depicted in iconography with a sword. He's the leader of the legions of angels. That's why I love him so much. <laughs> right. And these examples, like St. Michael that we have, really give us an idea, or rather a goal, shall we say, of trying to become more like Christ through the efforts of the saints. Yes. And I would say St. Michael is a great example of someone, an angelic being, who fights against evil, against the demons, against Satan himself. You know, in this article, it mentions courage, fortitude, heroism being required for warfare. And when we're talking about spiritual warfare, that is so important. In actual warfare, for example, we can think of, I mean, we can think of lots of movies. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who have served in the military that knows exactly what that means. It takes courage, fortitude, and heroism. These are masculine virtues that we shouldn't be ashamed of. You know, in the culture that we live in, men are sometimes shamed and told that it's not good for you to have those kinds of virtues, or you should tone it down a little bit. But the, the beauty of orthodoxy is that we're told to embrace these masculine virtues and to look at the example of the saints, to embody these virtues ourselves, and to become warriors, as this article says. It is about warfare. 
And so this is something that I think really does resonate with men and with women too, because there are powers out there, powers, principalities that we're warring with that we can't necessarily see in front of us. It's not a material warfare. It's a spiritual warfare. And if we don't think the spiritual warfare exists, we've already lost. And I think that's something that we always have to keep in mind. There are things behind the material things that we see that are kind of pulling the strings and are trying to bring us down. We have to be aware of it. If we don't even think that they're there, then there's no chance that we can even try to win. It's like bringing a feather to a gunfight, right, <laughs> Bryce? Yeah, that, that's, that perhaps is a really good analogy. <laughs> I would say so. The other thing I love about this section is that we're called to be athletes. And St. Paul uses this imagery in Scripture about running a race, for example. You know, I was an athlete. I mentioned I played football in the first episode. And one of the things I loved about being an athlete was the discipline that was involved. That was something that really motivated me. And that was also about self-mastery. Because in order to be great at any sport, it's not just football, it's basketball, it's hockey, it's baseball. You always hear the coaches talking about the fundamentals. And one of my favorite coaches used to say something that stuck with me to this very day. If you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that carries over into the rest of your life. This is why I think, Bryce, sports is so popular. This is why I think people enjoy not just playing sports, but watching sports. You know, when you get a bunch of guys together and you're watching an NFL game or you go to a college football game or a basketball game, there's real fellowship that happens, but People really get into the games, and I think there's a reason why. I think sports and that environment is something that we are wired to gravitate towards. That kind of environment is essentially creating an arena where we ourselves want to compete. And if we can't physically compete, we want to compete as fans. Bryce, what would you say about this athletic analogy? How does this speak to you? I think... Because I also played sports in high school, Michael. I played basketball. Mm -hmm. And I was my team captain. And a lot of the time, you know, you have the opportunity to be king for a day. Yeah. You have images in your head of hitting that three-pointer at the buzzer or catching the last touchdown of the game. Yeah. Those sorts of things in your mind. And you had to work to those things. Those were dreams that you had. And you're a part of a team a lot of the time. Yeah. Some sports are individual, of course, but... You're not just doing this alone. You're beside your brothers in the sport. Yep. You're beside other people. And I think intrinsically, people do want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, coming into the Orthodox Church, and like we mentioned earlier, you know, there is no one Christian. You are a part of something, and you have a role to play. And for some people, that is chanting. For some people, that is serving at the altar. For some people, that is standing and getting their family to go to church with them. Yes, exactly. And in athletics, you know, if you look at professional athletes and consider the sacrifice that they have had to make to actually get to their level, right? There's so much sacrifice involved in training, in practicing, in doing workouts. You you really sacrifice quite a bit of your life and it's to be the best, right? It's to become a professional at the sport. When we go to the weight room and we're working out, we want to become stronger. Well, it's the same thing for our spiritual lives. We have to go and we have to work out. And sometimes the workout may seem mundane. It may seem like, you know, I've done this week after week after week, but we're aiming for something. There is a goal. And there is the understanding that we need to work out our souls. We have to work out our salvation. And so coming to the church and doing a spiritual workout is likened to an athletical workout. It's the perfect analogy. And it's something where, you know, for example, when we come together and we are saying a lot of the same prayers and we're every week singing very similar hymns, if not the same hymn, some people might think, oh, well, that's boring. That's too repetitive. But these are the same people that maybe are going to a football game and hearing the same fight song every single week and Mm -hmm. getting extremely excited or going to the gym and they're doing the same workout over and over each week. 
And I think that's an interesting criticism when you say, well, this church, I just can't go to it because I'm just doing the same thing week after week. What would you say to that, Bryce? Well, I think, Michael, that frankly, there everything has an order to it, whether we realize it or not. Every church, every religious group has a liturgy of sorts. Mm-hmm. Athletic events are liturgies. That's right. Right? You know, you go to, a, I'll just mention my alma mater, you go to an Arkansas football game, there are songs that we sing before the game starts. At kickoff, we call the hogs. Touchdowns, we call the hogs. <laughs> That's right. We, you know, we're always singing the fight song every Ooh, so pig often. Suey. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, and Bryce, one thing that's interesting is, I, and when I've attended some football games, they even pass a collection plate for some charities. It even mimics the liturgy that we do in church. So I think it's a great analogy because it is a liturgical act. And if somebody is not attracted to church, it could be that they're attracted to something else like this. And I've heard this phrase before, Bryce, that sometimes people are just looking for God in the wrong place. And I don't want to say that everybody watching sports is doing that because I enjoy watching sports too. But it is possible for someone to obsess about it, to become obsessed and to make something into their God. You know, I fell into that trap as a young man. I wanted to watch every football game I possibly could and I neglected going to church. In that case, I was looking for God in the wrong place and I was becoming obsessed by something where I was really wired for that kind of environment because it is a communal environment to go to a football stadium for example to be there with friends to experience the pageantry to hear the fight song but that's essentially the same thing we do in our worship services and so it's interesting how if we put off church if we think church is not important we're going to find something to take its place yeah that's absolutely correct and in thinking about obsession, for example, it's a very narrow path in the sense of you can even make church your idol in the sense of your service to the church, yeah, your your role, not the role that you play, but you specifically in a part of it. Yeah, exactly. Let's finish off the rest of this part of the article under challenges. A recent convert summed up, quote, orthodoxy is serious. It's difficult. It is demanding. It is about mercy, but it's also about overcoming oneself. I am challenged in a deep way, not to feel good about myself, but to become holy. It is rigorous. And in that rigor, I find liberation. And you know, so does my wife. This quote really speaks to me, Bryce, especially the fact that orthodoxy is serious and it's difficult. You know, there is nothing more serious than focusing on our own salvation, right? Because after death, we don't get a do-over. Yeah. Eternal life is eternal. Is that eternity going to be in the kingdom of God, or is it not? That's serious. Absolutely. It is, like I said earlier, and I'm not the one who invented this quote, I believe it was Father Sarah from Rose of Blessed Memory, but orthodoxy is not just a name you call yourself. It is a life that you live. And being serious about your faith, and that, and even this man who's commenting here, he says, in that rigor, I find liberation, and you know, so does my wife. Yeah. It's not just him who finds it. It's not just her who finds it. They're both finding that. We all have our roles to play, and our roles in working out our salvation are indeed very serious. It is serious indeed, and it's interesting what this man said in the quote, so does my wife. You know, a lot of times men need to set the tone that we are the priests of our household. We have to we have to be the ones that initiate things. And women want strong men. That's something else. And and Bryce, you and I have had many conversations with men across, for example, our diocese. Some of them are single and some of them are wondering, where do I find a good wife? Where should I look? Some of them are really stressed out about it. Where do I go to try to find the right wife for me? And, you know, Father Hans has, has told us and has told you, you've shared this with me, that we should focus on improving ourselves first before we go out there and try to start dating. He even says he doesn't understand the whole dating thing, because if you're not intending to marry someone, why would you bother? And why wouldn't you focus on working on yourself first? What would you say about that, Bryce? Michael, I really like that you brought that up, because I often have heard the concept of working on oneself, and I myself have said, oh, I'm working on myself right now. Right. That is not something that is a passive activity. And I find myself slipping all the time, and I'm sure many other young men, 
and older men too are probably in the same boat. And with that, what matters is, you know, going to church, being active in the Christian life. And a lot of these things will fall where they may because of your efforts. Maybe not when you want them to necessarily. Right. But if you use the tools that the church has given you, I don't think that there's a way that you can fail. And trusting God and his plan, I know that can be an ambiguous term, but I think that if you're active in all of these things, and myself included, it's going to work out and you're going to find somebody. Yeah, and the interesting thing, Bryce, is it doesn't just work out because it works out. God really does take care of you. And when you do focus on yourself, on improving yourself, on putting your life in order, on creating a schedule, on trying to avoid the distractions, on trying to make progress spiritually, the most interesting thing, and I've experienced this, is that all of a sudden God is going to put somebody in your life when you least expect it. And it's usually not when you go looking for that person. And the most fascinating part of all of this is that you know that it was God that sent you that person. If you really do make a commitment to work on yourself so that you can be in the best position possible when the right person comes along to serve that person, that's when God is going to put that person in your life. And we should be praying. If we're single, for example, pray that God puts that person in your life, but realize that he may say no the first few times, the first dozen, it could be the the first few dozen times you're praying for it Mm -hmm. or more. It might be that you're just not ready for it yet, or that person isn't quite ready either. And so when you do work on yourself, all of a sudden, it's like what I said earlier, you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. And in this case, it's God that's taking care of that for you. Yeah. And when you think about leadership, right? Some people I think are definitely natural leaders. But it's a skill that requires some honing, some fine-tuning. And being able to lead somebody in a relationship is kind of a difficult thing to do. There's a, there's a way to do it, but you may not know to do that right away. Exactly. The last thing I'll say about this section is there's a part of this that really spoke to me. And we've talked about the fact that we don't just come to church to try to feel good about ourselves. That's, that should not be the goal. A lot of people do that. They want to come because it makes them feel good about themselves. But the purpose is to become holy. And what is holy? Holy is being set apart for God, right? And this is something that I've talked about so many times when we've had the opportunity to speak to men in the Antiochian men. In our culture, we're taught that we should be pursuing happiness. And it's even written in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America that we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that pursuit of happiness has become an obsession for a lot of people. We talked about obsession earlier. Happiness is elusive. Once you reach the level of happiness that you want, It's not good enough. Very quickly, you're searching for that next more intense level of happiness, and you keep pursuing it, and you keep wanting more extreme versions of that happiness, and it usually just leaves you empty. And one thing His Grace Bishop Nicholas in our diocese has taught us and has been preaching to our men especially is that there's a difference between happiness and joy. Joy being a fruit of the Spirit and something that comes and kind of wells up inside of you and just overflows your cup versus happiness, which is never quite enough to fill up that cup. And this pursuit really should be for holiness. We should be pursuing holiness, not happiness. Now, we may have happy times. There's nothing wrong with being happy. If that happens, then thank God for it. But really, the holiness should be the pursuit. And as we're thinking about what the world tells us we should be doing pursuing our happiness, if we make that slight shift and focus on what can I do to become more holy, or what can my wife and I do together to achieve holiness, happiness doesn't really mean the same thing anymore. It's not as important as people make it sound. You know, Bryce, one of the things, you know, I'm 40 years old, I'm married. One of the things that I hear a lot when, unfortunately, some of my friends outside of the church go through a divorce Oh, that person wasn't making you happy. 
you know, or they went to somebody who they're really having a good time with and, oh, at least that person makes you happy. But it's really not about happiness. It should be about holiness. And this is something that, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of people in the world falling for that lie that happiness is enough, that that's what we should be striving towards. And I would imagine, Bryce, in your situation as a young man, with the many distractions that are out there, there's so many things pulling young people in different directions, promising them fulfillment in what are really empty pursuits. And it's always being sold as, this will make you happy. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I would. And I think the issue with that too is, happiness in that context is the absolute rejection of suffering. And not that we are to bring suffering upon ourselves, but we accept it as we come and take it in a manly fashion, in a sense. And it's, hard to, it's hard to say that. Yeah. Sometimes it could be hard to apply oh, you know, I need to suffer. And I think that also helps you become more holy. And you can't do the suffering by yourself. Some things you may suffer with that somebody else may not suffer with, but when you come into the church, and I'm paraphrasing St. John Chrysostom here, but it is not a courtroom, but it is a hospital of souls. Yes, exactly. And Christ, the authentic, true Christ, the one that we see on the cross that we spoke about earlier— as someone who voluntarily ascended the cross, the ultimate act of a warrior, he gives us the ultimate example of what it means to bring meaning to our suffering. Finding meaning in suffering is one of the things that the church helps us with the most. You know, we're not always going to have great times. It's not going to be happiness 24-7. And the, what the church does is help prepare us for when we do encounter suffering, how to bring meaning to it, and how we can live our lives in the same way that Christ did. And so when we talk about becoming like God, when we talk about becoming more like Christ, that's the path that we follow. We use his example when he made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We should be willing, too, to die to ourselves for others. Well, Bryce, I think we can bring this podcast episode to a close. We went through the challenges subtitled section of this article, and there are indeed many challenges within the Orthodox Church, but they're good challenges. They're challenges that you and I have both gone through together in some cases, and each challenge that we go through together brings us a step closer to God, wouldn't you say? Yes, Michael, I would say that 100%. And even if it feels like you're taking two steps backward, you can always take another step forward. That's right. You know, what we want is an upward trajectory. So sometimes we do take a step back. The important thing is that we take two more forward. And I think that's very well said. There's a famous quote out there by Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi once said, it's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. And in our church, the most important thing that we're told over and over again is that we just get up one more time than we fall. And with help from each other and help from God, we can rise to all of the challenges that are put in front of us and use each challenge as an opportunity to become more and more like God. And I think that's an excellent place for us to leave this conversation today. We will go through the rest of this article in future podcasts. This will be a multi-part series. I would like to let everyone know that our podcast is already available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. So we're already on the major platforms. Please help us to spread the word about this podcast. Send it to a friend. Be sure to subscribe or follow our podcast on any of those platforms that I mentioned. And remember also to visit our website, antiochianmen.org, and our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash amendomse, which is A-M-E-N-D-O-M-S-E. We have a lot of video content that I'm sure you will find interesting, and we hope that you will come back and listen to our future episodes of Coming Out of Chaos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.